Everybody, welcome back to the next installment in our series on things I learned from recovering from serious mental illness and then sustaining that recovery for more than a decade. This video is on identifying core fears or underlying or root fears. This is about looking at what's actually underneath the superficial anxieties and intrusive thoughts we may see as the problem. If this is news for you, uh, that itself is gonna be a really useful recognition or insight. The stuff that's troubling you is not the stuff you're actually afraid of. Also, I wanna point out this is gonna be a two-parter. In this video, we're gonna look just at identifying those root underlying fears. The video right after this is gonna be about what do you do with that? We're not exploring this stuff to just make some kind of discovery that on its own will do anything. Always, the only reason we're doing exercises like this is so we can gather information that is going to shape and direct the changes and the actions we're gonna take. Just watching a video about uh, underlying fears doesn't, doesn't do anything on its own. It's like watching a video about how to make cookies. It's not gonna make you cookies. You have to go and make cookies. I hope you make cookies after this. Also, as we explore this, keep it light and practical. I think sometimes when we start using words like root fear or like core fear, uh, it, it seems like this big deal and like we gotta get ready for it. And oh no, what if we discover that our parents were actually working for the government to help them uh, breed super soldiers from alien DNA and we're actually going to destroy humanity. It's, that's not what we're gonna uncover here. Uh, what you're going to uncover may actually seem kind of simple, but then when you start to look at that simple uncertainty you're trying to control, a lot of the intrusive thoughts that may seem really unreasonable and irrational will actually start to make logical sense. To get into identifying that simple information, there's an exercise I often use. I talked about it in the Mind Workout, You Are Not a Rock, it's called The Five Whys. And when you do an exercise like this, I really strongly insist that you get it outside of your head. Uh, so, you know, grab your hedgehog notebook or whatever animal notebook you have available, grab something to write with, and make sure you get this down on paper so you can see it. Anytime you're doing any kind of mental health exploration, it's so useful to see what you're navigating to get it outside of your head, because I don't know if you've noticed, but talking inside of your head, not actually that useful. So the five whys is a common design thinking exercise. It's used in all sorts of industries. It basically recognize that usually the things that people think they want or they think they're afraid of uh, are not actually what they're trying to get or what they're reacting to. And so it's just a way to start to explore that. Uh, to do this, so at the top of a piece of paper, just write out that intrusive thought or that anxiety that's really troubling you right now. So for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna use the example of somebody that uh, is struggling with panic attacks and particularly the fear of panic attacks. So they're really anxious about having a panic attack out in public, at work, on a date, on a plane, wherever. That fear of having a panic attack, okay? If they said, I don't want to have a panic attack in public, I'd ask them, why not? And maybe they'd say something like, because they suck. Yeah, but why? And if they thought about it for a second, you know, maybe it's because you know, I act weird, I can't think of what I'm going to say, uh, I look like an idiot, they don't like you know, their heart racing, all sweaty, struggling to speak, but why is that bad? I don't want people to think I'm losing my mind. Okay, fair, but why not? Maybe they'd say something like I'd be that strange guy that everybody avoids. Okay, but why avoid that? Why not be a strange guy that everybody avoids? What's, what's wrong with that? because I want people to like me. So I don't want to have a panic attack in public because I want people to like me. It's that they've come to see a panic attack as a thing that's dangerous because the consequence of that they believe is that people will judge them, that people won't want to be around them. So 
One thing to note here, this is just an example. This is the example I'm gonna be using for these two videos. We've landed on this person being afraid of being judged by others, people not liking them, them being alone. Uh, there are many other core root fears we could have landed on there. Uh, and so it, it really is important to explore it with yourself or if you're working with somebody, explore it with them. Uh, you know, For instance, other ones that are really common that come up around panic attacks, it might be that the person is just afraid of losing control. Uh, they may have all sorts of other compulsions around checking memories, uh, false memories, uh, you know, avoiding all sorts of things that they fear could make them lose control and kind of you know, black out, lose consciousness, et cetera. And so they, they have a whole bunch of compulsions around that. Somebody else may be more afraid of losing their freedom. Maybe they believe that, oh, if I have a panic attack in public and people see that, they're gonna lock me up in a psychiatric hospital I'm gonna lose control over my life. And it's actually that fear of losing control. And they might have all sorts of other compulsions around trying to make sure they don't lose control. Uh, and there's more. And so just emphasizing, this is an example. If you're struggling with panic attacks, the fear of panic attacks, or you're working with somebody who is, that doesn't automatically mean it's about the fear of being judged. That's just one of the things it could mean. So that's why we explore something like this. This is not the end of the identifying work. When I'm working with coaching clients, I'd say we're only really exploring what that underlying core fear is just so we can get to this next piece of the exercise. And it's where we start to look at how that underlying root uncertainty is present throughout our daily lives, how we are constantly reacting to it, trying to control it or avoid it. And that that big intrusive thought that anxiety that maybe we identify with, like that's my theme, this is what I have, that's actually an outcome of all of this other stuff we're doing. So we're going to visualize that with what I like to call a logic mountain. So what you can do, grab your animal notebook again, get in there and at the top of a page, write that fear again and write it in such a way that it's at the, the peak of a mountain. So think we're gonna be making the peak of a mountain here. So let's get in there and write it down. You've got your mountain there. What if I have a panic attack in public? From the first part of the exercise, we know that that's about the fear of being judged, the fear of being hated on, the fear of being alone. Something else we know is that panic attacks and the fear of panic attacks involve lots of compulsions focused on the body checking physical sensations, trying to control physical sensation. So what I know from this is that this person is doing compulsions around their body in the hope of controlling their body to control what other people think. So the first thing I'd start to explore here on the mountain are gonna be checking and controlling compulsions around their body. They may not necessarily see them as compulsions, but if we started to dig into it a bit, maybe they'd notice, oh yeah, whenever I'm going into a room, I have a big meeting, I'm about to meet somebody, etc. I always check uh, my clothes to see if there's any weird stains on them. Right? They may see that as totally normal, but they notice they do that all the time. Or they also, they check to make sure their fly is up, buttons are buttoned, etc. They may do it a couple times even. Something they may have noticed is a bit of a problem. Uh, they may notice they do a bunch of like binge eating. Sometimes they might do really restrictive diets. They've done diet after diet. They're always looking for another diet, trying to control their body, and also constantly spending tons of money on supplements, chasing control around feelings in their body, controlling, trying to control how their body looks. If we explored a bit further about why they're taking those supplements, it might be some of the things we heard when we were talking about panic attacks. Maybe they're taking the supplements because they wanna have a feeling of being alert, being on, being in control. But they've probably noticed that they're just constantly looking for this right set of supplements to feel a certain way that they just can never feel. As we explore it further, uh, maybe they're checking smells again and again, right? A really obvious one around the body, worried about what other people will think if I smell. Getting ready each morning, focused on what others will think. This is one I ask people about all of the time, uh, especially if the person says they don't have time in their lives for meditation. 
do they spend an hour, two hours every morning meditating on what other people will think about how they look and then trying to control that with how they get ready in the morning. As we start to move a bit outside of the body when they're sending messages, emails, uh, text messages, whatever, messages on social media, dating profile messages, they notice they're rereading and rewriting messages to get them perfect, to control what other people think about them. Around all of this, they might be trying to use self-hate as motivation. So really seeing themselves as a problem to fix, hating on how they write, how they communicate, how they talk, how they feel, how they look, and somehow expecting that that's going to support them uh, in growth. They begin to control what other people think. They're doing another degree because they really want to chase that respect and their brain is not letting them feel like anything they do is ever enough. They might be spending so much time in so many areas thinking about what others think. Maybe they're spending days thinking about what color to paint their home office just because they're thinking about what other people are going to think about how it looks. White lies. They don't see them as problematic, but they're just always saying whatever they think other people want to hear. Ignoring their own needs in relationships, avoiding conflict at all costs. Maybe when they were young, they were struggling to find out how, just how to get love and affection and attention from other people. And they started to learn that overwork and just pushing themselves to extreme exhaustion was a way to get love and attention from others. As you work your way down the logic mountain, you're going to go back in time and you're gonna also going to go outwards to systemic issues happening around you. It's so often the case that not only have many things happened to a person that have required them to check and control around the self, to control what other people think, uh, but they may also be doing it simply for their safety. So look at things like body shaming, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, right? that constant code switching and controlling what other people are thinking for somebody's own safety just puts them in a position where the brain is going to try to help them. It's going to go, oh, okay, I need to control what other people are thinking to help keep us safe. The brain is super helpful. It's going to take that to extremes. Maybe they had an experience of immigrating somewhere. Maybe there were systemic gates, uh, bureaucracies around them that required them to perform and meet particular criteria that had them getting judged by somebody else just so they could get the opportunity to live. When somebody's struggling with poverty, they're constantly having to be put in situations where their performance is being judged and being questioned. And look at traumatic experiences that have happened. And, and somebody may not see them as traumatic, but you're guaranteed the brain noticed. That embarrassing thing that happened in grade eight, an illness you experienced as a kid, not having any control, constantly having people check your body, being told your body was a problem. It might have been an abusive relationship where you were constantly gaslit, you were constantly having to control how you acted, never knowing what was going to trigger the abuse. There are so many experiences that can happen to us. There are so many practices that we can engage in. And all of this comes together to form Mount what will other people think? Even if the panic attacks, the fear of panic attacks can seem unreasonable and irrational on its own, when we look at the entire mountain, it would be strange not to be having panic attacks. That might seem like a lot. It may seem like there's so much more that you're going to you have to make changes around, uh, so much more to explore that's going to be really sensitive, uh, that's going to bring up a lot of difficult feelings. And I get that. I get it. Maybe you're looking for a video on like, what's an affirmation I can say to get rid of anxiety about panic attacks. And now you have this piece of paper that says, ah, oh, change your entire life. On one hand, I get it. That can seem like a lot. But also, uh, personally, I found it really empowering and to also see how actually the things I was experiencing weren't just random, terrible things happening, but actually made a lot of sense. Even when you may have identified a lot of things on your logic mountain that 
that did happen to you. And don't lose sight of that. There is so much going on around us. There is so much that can happen to you. That's part of it. The brain is just trying to do its job. When we say, ah, I want to make sure nobody rejects me. I want to make sure I don't experience that pain again like I did in the past. The brain goes, okay, I'll think of all of the things that could cause that and I'll try to protect you from them. It's just being very logical. It's just trying to be very helpful. Now we get to go on a journey of showing our brain that we can interact with that uncertainty differently. And yeah, it is going to involve touching some of these really difficult experiences. It's going to involve touching a lot of vulnerability. So check out the next video. There we're going to get into, so what do you start to do with this information? How do we take action on it? If you're finding any of this stuff confusing, overwhelming, throw some comments down in the comment section down below or reach out on the Mental Fitness Discord server. If you want to join the Mental Fitness Discord server, send me a DM on Instagram and I can connect you with that there. In the meantime, be nice to yourself. Yeah, even, this may sound weird, be nice to your brain. I know I, I say a lot of trash about the brain. I criticize the brain a lot. I talk about firing the brain, taking it out of my skull, etc. I know, I know. But at the end of the day, the brain is just trying to help us. Uh, I mean, it's terrible uh, at its job, but it is just trying to do its job. So, yeah, let's give some kindness to the brain uh, and kindness to ourselves. Yeah, you are navigating a really complex world full of uncertainties every day. And you're just trying to navigate that in the best way you can. So kindness to yourself, even maybe kindness to the brain. Try it and see. Let me know if that works. But uh, anyhow, uh, check out the next video and we'll get into the actions. What do we actually do once we've under uncovered some core fears?